about that? Oh, I got to do that. Okay, we're good. Okay, good. very good. Okay, so as I was saying, in this project, we um, uh, automated and systematized the process of building UV complete models, starting from effective operators. And specifically, uh, we kind of targeted all of this machinery at the problem of looking for UV completions of operators in the standard model effective field theory that violate lepton number by two units, just as a kind of initial example. And that's interesting because those UV completions, of course, once you violate lepton number by two units, you're inevitably, you're inevitably going to generate a Mayorana neutrino mass. So it's, it's really a kind of factory. This code, which we ended up publishing at this um, GitHub reference, uh, is, is a kind of factory for building models of neutrino mass. Good. Okay. So this is the structure of the talk. I'll begin with a general introduction and background, just some initial comments about neutrino masses and things like this. I'll talk about um, how we automated this procedure of model building from EFT. But then I'll talk about specific, some specifics of the models on the neutrino mass side, whereas section two is kind of more agnostic to that. And finally, I'll give some closing thoughts about uh, automated model building phenomenology and where we might go from here. Great, okay. So it's probably not the first time you've heard the statement that uh, neutrino oscillations imply neutrino masses, which imply new physics. There's no way around it. Um, you need to extend the standard model in some way if you're going to account for the masses of the neutrinos. But unfortunately, we're in a situation that you could do a whole host of things to explain the available data that we have, right? The number of neutrino mass models is in principle incredibly large. The, the so-called theory space is very, very large. And so unfortunately, it seems like uh, uh, it's going to be a very, very long process to try and nail down exactly which the correct model is, if we'll be able to do that at all, right? Um, it's been a very long time that we've been writing down these models, and it's been a very long time that the experimental sensitivity to the neutrino, to the you know, low energy uh, 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 neutrino parameters, mixing parameters and things like this has been increasing. And yet, you know, we're still not, not necessarily any closer. So it would be really good if we could have some way of kind of uh, uh, quantifying how much progress we are making from these experiments or any future experiments that might give us some hints. Now, of course, there are more motivated models and more elegant models. But unfortunately, it's the case that most of these, at least in my opinion, uh, have to live at energies that are absolutely not testable. But as I say, it would be really good if we did see something that would, if we did get lucky, for example, and see something like Charles lepton flavor violation, that might give us some hint about what kinds of models don't, aren't correct and, and which kinds of models uh, uh, are more likely to be correct. Now. Um, of course, this is the case because Neutrino oscillations themselves violate lepton flavor, and so Charles lepton flavor violation is a generic prediction in neutrino mass models. And actually here, there, there is uh, something to be optimistic about, because the next generation of experiments is boasting some huge increase in the levels of sensitivity. Just as an, as an example, um, for the specific case of a mu one to three electrons, the mu three e, the mu three e experiment based at PSI is going to probe branching ratios as low as 10 to the negative 16. Uh, this is very impressive, and for tree-level models, the, the associated scale that's being probed is very, very large. So this is quite exciting, I think. Um, of course, there are some who would say that maybe we already have some evidence of lepton flavor universality violation, but I think it's also not uh, unknown now that there is some rumor that maybe these, uh, maybe these uh, anomalies are going away. And so, of course, as usual, we need more data to, to be able to say anything for sure. And I think a lot of people are waiting for, for some announcements. And it goes without saying that if we saw neutrinoless double beta decay, this would be very, very useful because it would allow, allow us to distinguish between models of Dirac and Majorana neutrino mass. And I also include here proton decay because proton decay is uh, one of those phenomenological signals that will tell us, or, or at least that can probe, very, very, very high scales. And in fact, the, one, the scales that are most motivated in, this kind of, in, the, in these kinds of uh, model building scenarios. Very good. Okay, so one thing that all of the models in that space of, of neutrino mass models needs to have in common is that they need to explain why the neutrino masses are so small, right? That some six orders of magnitude difference between the, the mass of the electron and the, and, and the neutrinos, so that this needs to be explained and it would be nice if we had a good explanation for that. I'll advocate that, you know, if neutrinos are Majorana, 
then they have to come from this dimension five operator. And then the mass generation is, is in principle quite different to uh, the mass generation that you have for the other fermions in the standard model, which happens at dimension four, not at dimension five. And therefore you expect uh, the neutrino masses to be small. So this is, this is one reason um, that might explain that. It's not the only reason. And so for that, or at least in this talk, I'll, I'll only be concentrating on models of Majorana neutrino mass. I'll just make that caveat here. <clears throat> but so if you imagine that the neutrinos are Majorana, there are really two ways that you can arrange for the masses to be small, given that they arise uh, in this way. One way, of course, they're really kind of two limiting, two limiting uh, uh, ways. One, of course, is that lambda is very large. And I'm going to collectively call these seesaw models, right? And that's because the general suppression that you get is V squared on lambda. So if C5 is you know, some order one number, then lambda being very large suppresses the neutrino masses. And this 10 to the 14 GeV scale is roughly close to the scales predicted in grand unification, and maybe that's some kind of argument um, in, in the direction of the seesaw models. Also, a diagram like this is very simple, right? It involves a kind of, you know, one stand, one extent, one field to extend the standard model by. That's how you count the fermion, terms of the fermion, but you know, not, not much, basically, not much of an extension. But there are other alternatives. For example, it could be that for some reason, the coefficient C5 happens to be very small. Uh, again, that's a limiting case. In the limit that C5 is incredibly small, then lambda could be quite low, and therefore those models are more testable. So you have this spectrum. Right? Some examples here are, I think famously, the inverse seesaw mechanism, where you have that the lepton number violation is proportional to something like C5, um, and therefore it's technically natural for it to be very, very small. Uh, in addition, that's also true of radiative models, models where the neutrinos don't have mass at the tree level just by coincidence, but instead gain mass, the, the neutrino self-energy diagram enters at first order at loop level. And here you also have the, the product of couplings in a diagram like this, violates lepton number by two units, and therefore together technic it's technically natural to take them to be small. But you also have standard model Yukawa couplings and couplings like the, in um, diagrams like these, and also loop suppression. So all of these things can conspire to, to make C5 small or at least significantly smaller than one. And, and that means that these models are much more testable. Very good. But still, you know, it's of course the case, as I said, this is, there's, a, there's a spectrum between these two classes of models and there are very, very many of them. And so whenever we have a situation like this, it's not specific to the case of models of neutrino mass, right? It's often the case that we can write down many models to explain the same low energy data that we have. And how can we quantify progress in a scenario like that? And I think it would be nice if we had these two things to be able to do that. The first is a systematic method for deriving the models. That's because when the model space is so large, it might be that you have some actually interesting model that was, it, for which it wasn't obvious that the model was interesting initially. So you maybe didn't think to look in that region of parameter space or something like that. But your systematic method derived the model for you. And then you can look at it and say, oh, actually, that's a, that's a really interesting model. It has these interesting signatures or something. And second, once you have all of these models, if you have a systematic way of deriving them, then you want to cluster that space in an intelligent way that allows you to say, for example, that all of the models of this class share some phenomenological signature, for example, if that's what you're interested in. And all of the models of this class share some phenomenological signature. In a situation like that, then if you did see some experiment that ruled out class two, right? Now you've ruled out this whole class of models and you can, you can, you can see how much progress that you've made. It's not just now that we still don't know what the neutrino masses are or the, 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 what the neutrino mass mechanism is. At least we can say, well, we've ruled out concretely all of these options. We've reduced the space by 50% or something like that. So this is the approach that we try and take in, in this project. Um, great. Now I'll say that uh, there are really two traditions of approach like this, uh, specifically for building models of Majorana neutrino mass. The one on the left here and the associated references and the one on the right, the associated references. So I'll go through these in order. The one on the left is essentially the following. Ah, he's there. Yeah, chalk, very good. So if you imagine just a blob, right, that represents the Weinberg operator, which is this dimension five turn, 
with two leptons and two Higgs fields that generates the dimension three Majorana mass for the light that tended to You can imagine thinking about this blob and thinking, well, what are all of the possible models that I can fit into that blob? What are all of the possible topologies that I can fit into this blob at tree level? At one loop level? At two loop level? Etc. Then you've successfully uh, systematized the procedure of building Majorana neutrino mass models. If you, if you actually write down all of the tree level topologies that, that can fill in this blob, those are all of the tree level models. Of course, you have to make some assumptions. And that, that is a caveat to all of this. Of course, you have to make some assumptions. But um, those, those assumptions can be motivated. But in any case, according to those assumptions, you can write down all of the tree level models, all of the one loop models, all of the true loop models, et cetera. And then you've organized the space of neutrino mass models now by, you've kind of dissected the space by whether the neutrino masses are generated at tree level, one loop, two loop. And that's very useful um, because that tells you something about the scale lambda. If you assume, for example, that this coefficient, well, you don't have to assume that, sorry, I mean, the coefficient, if you just assume that uh, all the other numbers are roughly order one and the only suppression that you get is from the loops, you know, in this particular case, for example, that this has three loops of suppression, and that gives you a prediction of lambda, right? Just as an example. So the idea here is that you generate the Weinberg operator or its higher dimensional analogs at different <coughs> loop orders. So this diagram is in the EFT at tree level diagram. So one way of describing this procedure is loop level completions of operators that generate neutrino masses at tree level, right? And that's a very useful. Um, and this is being done impressively all the way up to three loops by, by um, uh, a group that's based in Valencia. Great. Okay. But then there is this uh, separate tradition of work that does something slightly different. Here, the idea is to first write down all of the operators that violate lepton number by two units, not just the Weinberg operator. Right. So here, for example, you have the Weinberg operator, of course, but then some dimension seven operators. Here, another dimension seven operator, but in principle, you can keep going. Actually, these operators enter only an odd mass dimension as a result. It was proved in this table. Okay. So once you do that, of course, now you violated lepton number in two units. Once you introduce a non-zero value for this coefficient at some scale, you violated lepton number in two units, and a neutrino self-energy diagram will occur at some order in perturbation theory, right? And so you can you can explore that. Here you can say this, this is the specific operator in this case. You can show an insertion of that operator and then say, well, how do I get the neutrino self energy diagram? I have to loop things off with standard model interactions. I need to you know, put a W boson here. And now you get a wealth of information if you estimate the, the matching of this diagram onto the, onto the dimension three layer on a neutrino mass term. Okay, so uh, this is the tradition into which our paper fits. And we use this approach rather than the other one. Um, there is a lot more to say about that, but that's all I'll say. Um, and so this approach can be described as tree level completions of operators that generate neutrino masses at loop level, right? So whereas in this case, you were filling in this blob, say with potentially uh, loop level topologies. In this case, you already have the loops. You're filling in this blob only with tree level topologies and therefore it's easier to automate. You also get uh, uh, more information about the scale. That comes at a cost though, um, but maybe we'll talk about that later. Okay, great. So just to illustrate the process, say you started with a dimension nine operator. This is a kind of cartoon of a dimension nine operator that violates lepton number by two units. The idea is to kind of loop this off so that you get something like the Weinberg operator, so that when the Higgs is verb, you generate a Majorana neutrino mass. And then from here, you can estimate the matching contribution. You can say, well, it has to go like true loops. So we can estimate that to be something like a suppression of one on 16 pi squared or true factors of that. And you can also see that uh, here you need insertions of the down Yukawa matrix. So we have two factors. So you can use this to, to estimate the, the neutrino mass matrix. In fact, in many cases, even information about the flavor structure of the neutrino mass matrix, when these things depend on the charge electron Yukawa's, for example. Okay. So to summarize the entire procedure, starting with these delta L equals two operators, we estimate the matching contribution to get some indication of the structure of the neutrino mass matrix, the scale in which the new physics should lie, and things like this. 
This is just using the operator. There's no UV information. But then our novel step is to take these operators and figure out all of the possible models that might fill in that block. And when I say models, I really do mean gauge invariant, only renormalizable couplings, a full Lagrangian. We're writing everything out, every index explicit. This is the completion procedure. Then once you have all of those tree level diagrams, I'm just showing one example here, then you can plug them back into that blob and you get a full model of neutrino mass. This is the summary of the procedure. And what's novel for us is this, this completion procedure, which we have called exploding the operator. Uh, so this part is a little explosion there. You kind of uh, open that thing up. Okay, that's the, that's the uh, summary of what we're doing. I'll stop here if there are any questions about where our work fits here or if there are any questions about what we just said. Okay, so now I'll talk about automated model building from effective field theories. So the idea here, as I said, is we want to fill in this blob in all possible ways at tree level. You can think about this in a number of ways. For example, you could think about asking, well, what are the possible resonances that I might have in different scattering channels, for example? So if you had, say, Higgs lepton scattering, then it could be that you have a fermion resonance. And you can see this even just from the Feynman diagram, right? just from the fermion flow in the Feynman diagram, but also from the operator, just from the, the index structure, right? because this lepton carries a, um, a spinner index and this Higgs does not. So if you wanted to replace the lepton and the Higgs with some other field, it better carry a um, spinner index, for example. But you can also read off all of the gauge quantum numbers in the same way. So the Higgs is a, it's an SU2 doublet, the lepton is an SU2 doublet, and you can form a singlet uh, from those already. So N could be a singlet, for example. And so uh, N could be just this uh, Mayer on a fermion. Here I've shown the Lorentz quantum numbers. I, by that, I just mean that it's a fermion. Um, good. That's just one option, though. I didn't have to only look at, say, lepton and Higgs scattering or the, the grouping the H and the L. I also could have grouped both Hs. In that case, you have um, SU2 indices, SU2 isospin indices on the Higgses that have to be symmetric. And that symmetric contraction is, the, is exactly the SU2 triplet contraction, right? So this thing has to be an SU2 triplet. It has to be a scalar because it's coupling to some pieces, et cetera. So you can read off all of the possible quantum numbers um, in this way. Then again, you could do this for the, for the third option, which is just to take the SU2 indices to be symmetric in triplet representation. Um, and in doing so, you've derived all of the tree-level topologies, all of the tree-level models that can fill in that plot. And actually, in doing so, we've derived all of the canonical seesaw models. So these are very famous models. You can see they were... Um, I, I'm giving the references here. But, you know, interestingly, it took some 10 years after the first one was written down to write down the last one. So this, there's something to be said about the systematic method, right? You don't miss any models if you do it this way. And this is really roughly what the code does, even though I'll go through a much more complicated example later. Um, uh, there, there are very many details missing from this example because it's the simplest possible example, right? There are no derivatives in this operator, for example. There are no field strings. Uh, the, 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 the operator is absolutely unique for a single generation of fermions. So there's no redundancy from Fiat's identities or field redefinitions involving the equations of motion and things like this, right? It's a very, very simple case. Um, but this is essentially what we're doing. Yes. So uh, it also depends on uh, up to which dimension you are considering. For example, if you, if you just consider dimension five, mm -hmm. then you read completion model it could be different. If you go up to let's say seven dimension, then you then there'll be more models, right? Yes, exactly right. So it should also depend on the dimension you are considering. It certainly does. That's exactly right. The number of models increases significantly depending on the the mass dimension of the operator that you're exploding, so to speak. However, you can't go just arbitrarily to higher and higher mass dimension, right? Uh, there's a good reason for that. Um, Maybe I'll just mention it briefly because I discuss it later. And that's that, of course, what we have is that the mass of the heaviest neutrino should be larger than a particular value, right? That allows you to place an upper bound, very important, an upper bound on the scale of the new physics. So you can't just suppress the neutrino masses to zero, right? 
uh, the, the, the neutrino mass has to be heavier than a certain value. So you can't just keep suppressing the neutrino mass, and so you do have to stop at some stage. Now, where exactly you stop seems to have been misrepresented in the literature, and that was another result of our study that, that, that we'll discuss later. But of course, you, you have to go to higher mass dimension. This is just a, this is just a, a simple example. That's right. Great. Okay. So um, just to show you exactly what our code does, I wanted to take this simple example and show you what it looks like in the code. Uh, so this is the operator here, and I'm representing it computationally in Python in, in the language of um, the package in this way. So you can see here the lepton doublet has more indices than I've shown here because you have to explicitly put in the color indices and say that they're undotted. That's what that u means. But in general, you can see I think it's quite a passable syntax and looks actually quite similar to uh, the LaTeX that, that I've shown up there. Um, and then all you need to do is call completions on the operator and the code will spit out for you three model objects, which are the three um, uh, seesaw models. But now these model objects contain a wealth of information. It's not just telling you that you know the type three seesaw model contains this, or the type two seesaw model contains this triplet scalar, right? Because uh, you could ask of these models, say of the first one, what's the Lagrangian? This is the Lagrangian in a symbolic algebraic form with every index explicit. Now that's very important because you can imagine passing this um, to some automated phenomenological framework, right? Like uh, Gambit or, you know, exporting a finals file or something like that in the future, for example. You can ask about the effective Lagrangian, which goes back to the slide about, you know, uh, uh, clustering the space of models according to testable predictions, right? If you, if you can cluster them by the, by the dimension, the, 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 the operators that they generate at dimension six, then you can really make clear claims about um, uh, the phenomenology of these models. You can also inquire about the, the symmetries of the Lagrangian and of course the tree level diagram, things like this. There's all, all kinds of goodies inside these model objects. Okay. <clears throat> so what we're really doing when we do this is running the process of tree level matching and what I've shown on the left here is just the process of tree level matching, right? I've, I've shown heavy fields with a capital letter, a capital Greek letter, and light fields with lowercase Greek letters. And so you start with some high energy Lagrangian that has this heavy field capital Phi, but then you linearize the Lagrangian, you get the equations of motion, replace capital Phi by the equations of motion, and you have this regular EFT expansion in momentum squared on mass squared. And then from here, you have to match onto some basis of operators, right? So you have to do all kinds of, you have to account for all kinds of redundancy in the, in the operators so that you remove all the ones that are, that you can relate to each other. And then once you derive the operators that are generated in your UV model, you have to do all kinds of Fiat's relations and, and all kinds of transformations on them, move derivatives around with integration by parts to match them onto your basis. But then when you do that, you have some vector CI, some, you know, sequence of numbers that represents the tree level matching contribution. But this is, a bit funny, and this is a, a subtle point, and it's the following. Well, what does it mean to have a UV completion, right? It just means that you have some non-zero value for the operator coefficient at some scale in this vector. But of course, it's clear that a change of basis will change what all of those numbers look like in the vector. Even a change of basis that leaves the definition of, say, C1, if that's what you were interested in, unaffected. If you changed all of the other CI and not C1, for example. Well, everything moves around now. So talking about a completion of an operator isn't something that you can do without first placing that statement in the context of a spanning set of operators. Someone can't just give you an operator in a vacuum and say, what are the completions of this? That doesn't, that's not a question that makes sense. <clears throat> Good. First point. The second point is that if you did want to think about running this backwards, how on earth are you going to reverse all of these transformations, right? How are we going to move the derivatives around in all possible ways so that you can um, uh, uh, undo the effects of integration by parts redundancy or it, it, equivalently um, conservation of momentum, right? How are you going to account for field redefinitions from the equations of motion and things like this? And the answer is to choose your spanning set of operators very, very carefully. So that's what we do. We try and be as general as possible. We use something called a Green's basis, which means that in the uh, operators, we haven't accounted for redundancies for, um, from field redefinitions involving the equations of motion. We just don't account for them. 
uh, we um, don't specify, for example, the Lorentz structure of the operators. We kind of have the operator stand in for a family of Lorentz structures. And what that allows us to do is when you derive the UV completion, you kind of don't need to account for these uh, redundancies because they're already accounted for in the, in the basis or the spanning set that we use. But what that means, so now, you know, these arrows are going backwards. So when you integrate out the field, you get this sum of operators. That's the, that's the uh, operator that's generated by some model. But if you just started with say one of those, operator one, and ask, well, how do I run this backwards? It has to be, and it is the case that our procedure, what it does is it tells you, as you derive a completion, all of the other operators that, that it needs to be related to so that you can reconstruct this sum. So we kind of derive the operator that's generated from the bit that we have in our basis or in our spanning set. Great. But we have this desire, and I really want to emphasize this, that we want to be as general as possible. We kind of, even though there's been huge progress in um, uh, uh, reducing the number of operators, um, you know, and accounting for all, all possible redundancies, uh, actually, we don't want to do that in this case. And that motivates uh, the standing set of operators that we use that I'll introduce now. But one thing that we do want to distinguish, basically the only thing that we do want to distinguish is the SU2 structure. And that's because the SU2 structure gives huge differences. Different SU2 structures will give huge differences in the prediction for the neutrino mass. And so we don't want to lose all the predictive information that was motivating this whole scenario to begin with, right? So here you have two examples of operators in our language, operator 3A and operator 3B, to mention seven operators that violate lepton number by two units. And here you can see, it's just from a consequence of this SU2 structure, that it's IKJL compared to IJKL, right? Then in this first diagram, you do already have two neutrinos. And so the self-energy diagram is one loop. Whereas in this case, you don't. You have an electron that you need to convert into a neutrino with a W boson that gives you all kinds of suppression. And actually, the ratio of these neutrino masses is three orders of magnitude in this case. So it is quite important to distinguish these two structures. So this is what our spanning set of operators look like. We give a separate, sorry, a separate number to each um, uh, operator that has a different field content. Because we don't account for redundancies due to the equation of equations of motion, each numbered operator, um, sorry, the, the, the UV completions won't give rise to different, will always give rise to operators, will always generate operators that contain the same fields that don't get mixed up by the equations of motion, right? And then different SU2 structures are given by these Latin indices. So for example, 5A and 5B only differ with these epsilons. And the way we construct the invariance, the SU2 invariance, is just to take every possible anti-symmetric combination of pairs of SU2 indices. And that's quite important. So every two pairs of indices that can be anti-symmetric in a particular operator are represented in the list somewhere. That's quite important. Okay, so we do this all the way up to dimension 11, going back to, going back to your point earlier. Um, we thought this would be enough. Actually, at the time, we thought this would be enough, and I'll say something about that. Um, and of course, you know, I mean, what this needs to be checked, and we check it using Hilbert series techniques that give you invariance. But actually, in this case, we were only interested, you know, I mean, it's quite a task to use the Hilbert series even to write out all operators, all the invariance at dimension 11. We specifically only wanted the ones that violated lepton number by two units. Um, and you can use the Hilbert series. Usually it's used to project out singlets, right? You can do that because this contour integral is going to pick out because you're dividing by Z here, only the delta L equals zero component. But if you divide by Z cubed, right, then you'll pick out only the delta L equals two component, um, which is very useful. And then if you don't want to account for redundancies from the equations of motion, for example, or from integration by paths, just don't include those sporions in the Hilbert series. And the counting is all correct. Good. Okay. So now I'll come to an example of how uh, uh, the, the completion algorithm works. Basically, uh, one can think about it as a kind of abstract term rewriting system. And I'll show that over here. So on the left here, uh, we'll see as we go that there will be kind of uh, a term, term rewriting structure on the left. On the right, I'll represent exactly the same information, but in the diagrammatic language. And then at the top, I'll show you how we derive 
the UV Lagrangian as we go. So, of course, there are many choices to be made. Sorry, the last thing I'll say um, is that here, the Lorentz indices, which are alpha beta and alpha dot beta dot, et cetera, um, are, are not contracted, they're free. And that goes back to the point earlier about being agnostic about the Lorentz structure. But anyway, um, we have choices to be made about how we group things here, just like we had choices about how we grouped uh, uh, fields in the Weinberg operator. I'm just going to show one branch in the series of slides. But you could imagine that we that we group off these two leptons. So that's what I've shown here. We're grouping off these two leptons. So the free indices here are alpha and beta, which say if we're interested in a scalar completion, have to be contracted into the singlet. So we have to introduce an epsilon alpha beta because we want to couple to a scale. And then second, these raised indices i and j have to be symmetric. So we symmetrize them. Why do they have to be symmetric? Because the anti-symmetric combination is already represented in a different operator in our list, right? That was the whole point. That's how we derived the, the spanning design. So this is telling you the additional bits that you need to add on and how you need to add them on to get the full gambit of, uh, of, of operators that are generated, starting from just this one. And then, you know, it, this, I said this needs to be a triplet and a scalar, and the hypercharge is trivial to construct. And so you see that this needs to be this scalar character xi1. Now on the right, is a diagrammatic uh, approach, and it's just the same information. And you can see that we've kind of partially resolved this blob. That's the idea. And this is a this is a renormalizable interaction, and I've represented it here. So now you have a different uh, effective interaction of this matrix. And this process can continue. In this case, there are some color indices A, B. <clears throat> Even though I don't show it on the previous slide, internally the code does distinguish between different color structures. So the same the same things apply. Uh, in this case, these are symmetric, so um, you, you can you can symmetrize them uh, uh, and again introduce a scalar because we're in this particular branch we're just looking at scalar completions. Um, that the color indices are symmetric means that it needs to be the six-dimensional representation, and then this can finish here, and it finishes at the point where you don't have any blobs left, so to speak. Right? You've resolved every interaction, and this Lagrangian is is written in terms of dimension four u countwise interactions. So we've constructed every index in the Lagrangian, right? The whole structure, even without a group theory engine, just by some simple arguments and by constructing the basis uh, in, in, in a kind of sneaky way. Also, we've generated the operator with explicit Lorentz and gauge structure that you can then take and match onto any genuine basis of operators that you like. And at, in this case, at dimension nine, there is, there is a genuine basis of operators that has been written down. Good, okay. So as I said, this needs to be done in all possible ways. You have to make all possible combinations, which is why this is a job for a computer, right? And so here I've given a kind of just a sample of a diagram. This black path is the path that I showed you on the previous slide, but there are other choices, right? Why did I choose to group the Qs together? I could have chosen to group a Q and a U bar. That would have given me this branch and there were more things branching from there. But actually in our model building, we just make the choice of introducing Majorana and vector-like fermions just to avoid problems with anomalies and giving them large masses and things like this, but also only scalars. We don't introduce vectors because, you know, who wants to think about giving them mass in a renormalizable way and extending the gauge group? Uh, we really wanted these to be UV completions in the sense that they have good high energy behavior. So we didn't, we, we discount paths like this that introduce vectors, even though in principle, you could, you could include them. Uh, nothing would change about the way that you derive the models. Okay, very good. So that's what I'll say about uh, the, the model building section. And I'll move on to the specific, some specifics of the neutrino mass. Are there any questions about that section? Right. So, you know, the discussion of the last section was basically neutrino mass agnostic, but now we'll hone in some more on, on the neutrino mass, right? And this is our entire procedure from beginning to end. The first thing we do, actually these first two dot points only depend on the IR information, right? On the effective operators and the EFT itself. Um, the first is moving off the operator into Weinberg-like operators like this, and then getting the estimate of the matching. That gives you a bound on lambda, useful. It gives you an estimate of the neutrino mass matrix, its structure, all useful, good stuff. Second, drive it, derive the estimates on the neutrino mass scale, sure, no worries. But then three and four, 
has to do with the UV information, right? So we derive the UV models as just discussed using our algorithm and our code, but then these need to be filtered. We have this process of filtering, something I'll go into uh, in more detail soon, where basically you want to remove models that are always only a small correction to the neutrino mass rather than a dominant contribution. If that model is always going to be a small correction, there's no reason to think about it. It's kind of always in the shadows. And finally, we took that filtered list of models and packaged it um, into a database that is queryable and searchable. And hopefully I'll have some time to give a demo. Good. Great, so IR information and UV information. Um, so this is how we present our results in the paper. You can see here that the number of loops at which the neutrino mass occurs and the estimate of the scale lambda just depends on the effective operator framework and some assumptions. Actually, we update these compared to previous literature. Um, and you can see that the upper bound on lambda can actually, in some cases, be very, very low. This, this is saying that if operator eight is the origin of neutrino masses, that the new physics can't be above two TV, like, oh, sorry, 20, 20 TV, which is very significant. Great. And then in these columns, we have the number of models that are generated, but then after filtering, you can see that very often, um, uh, the filtering makes quite a large difference. So this is what I'll talk about now. The idea is the following. Suppose you had two operators, um, uh, O and O prime, right? And when you do the closure diagram, when you estimate the, the matching onto the, onto the Weinberg operator, you find that um, the neutrino mass in, uh, in the case of O has to be proportional to some low scale M. But in the case of O prime, it's proportional to some very high scale capital M. And you apply the completion procedure as we saw on the, in the previous section. And you find some delta L equals true Lagrangian derived in the way that we discussed. And some different delta L equals true Lagrangian over here. However, the delta L equals true Lagrangian here and here aren't necessarily the only bits of the Lagrangian, right? In principle, given the field content, you should write down all of the interactions that are allowed by the symmetries. And it could be the case that when you do that for these two Lagrangians, actually they end up being the same, right? So really the models are the same. There's no reason to distinguish them. This will always happen when the field content of these two models is the same. So you might have one particular interaction of one of the exotics featuring here and not here and vice versa. But how are you going to write down a model? It's not clear that you can, right? In many cases, um, to impose some symmetry or something like that to prevent this mechanism, but allow this one or vice versa. So we take this, what we call the democratic approach. We just assume that there isn't any kind of special hierarchy of couplings. And that in general, it's going to be too difficult to try and impose symmetries on things in a systematic way. So we just say that if this case occurs, this model is, is this operator is filtered out. Operator O is filtered out because its contribution to the neutrino mass is always going to be much smaller than the contribution from this diagram or this operator. And actually, this was the original motivation for the whole project. It was the case that when we tried to write down completions, say, of dimension 9 or dimension 11 operators, it was always the case that you ended up generating lower dimensional operators. And this kind of makes sense, right? Because if you're, if you're pairing up fields, like LQ, for example, there's only a, a finite number of fields that will couple to standard model fermion bilinears like this. So once, you've, once you have models that feature all of these, then when you have some very, very high dimensional operator and you start trying to construct a unique completion, eventually the, the, you, you'll reach a stage where you've, just, you've already seen all of these models. So uh, you'll just be always generating those lower dimensional operators and then dominate the neutrino mass compared to what you're looking at in that particular instance. Um, okay. So this is an example of some results. And actually, it's quite surprising, um, just from what I was saying earlier, that in many cases that I've shown here in black, the filtering procedure completely removes all of the models that were discovered. So for example, all of these 48 models that generate operator O11A also generate lower dimensional operators. And so it can't be the case that operator O11A in this language is the dominant contribution to the neutrino masses. And therefore, you can, you can basically rule it out as being interesting for neutrino masses. We haven't done any experiments. And indeed, you can see this is just a small sample of the list. Remember, there are 150 operators. 
There is a large class of such um, operators, all of whose completions uh, are, are only corrections to the NMS and, and not dominant contributions. So this is quite a nice result. But actually it turned out to be the case that we were completely wrong, that it was gonna be so, so difficult to write down uh, completions at dimension 11, but this was not obvious. You have to do it on a computer, right? And I'll just draw your attention to the um, plot on the right here. I have a histogram, uh, sorry, a bar, bar chart of the number of models um, derived at mass dimension shown on the x-axis, so 5, 7, 9, 11. Um, and you can see, okay, at dimension 5, there's just three models. But at dimension 7, 9, and 11, actually, the number of filtered models grows and grows very steeply. So even though it was difficult to write them down, we just weren't looking hard enough. Um, and it was quite a laborious process to do it by hand. Um, and you can see a lot of this comes down to just generating one of these seesaw fields, right? Uh, you can see that 50% um, of the models contain the type two seesaw scalar. And once you've generated that, you're always going to have a dominant contribution from the tree level diagram compared to the loop level diagram. Good. Um, so also I'll say that uh, all of these models, you know, four, 430,000 of them or whatever, uh, and, and the Lagrangians have been pack packaged up into a database that's at this address, and that, that database is searchable. Okay, so I'll skip this. Um, this is just to look at some of the exotic fields that exist in the database. You can ask all kinds of questions of the database now because it's queryable, right? You can say, well, what are the fields that appear? What are the exotic fields that appear? And here you see that actually the most represented class of fields is scalar lambda class. And, you know, we have some ideas about why this might be the case. Um, I won't go into them here. Uh, but you also have diquarks, dileptons, and then other fields here, you know, I haven't, I haven't labeled them, uh, because they only couple to other exotic fields. So you can see that the, the, of, of the space of exotic fields that are introduced in these neutrino mass models, most of them couple to two, to two or three standard model fields. Right. And then you can ask a question like the following, you know, every, every dot um, around this circle is another sorry, is one of the exotic fields that appears in the completions. And then you could draw a line or a link between each field or each multiplet that appears in a model together, right? So if these two multiplets appear, appear in the same model, draw a line. And then if they appear in two models, draw two lines, etc. So the color is some indication of the strength of the connection. And then you can cluster the space in these clusters, one, two, three, four, five. Um, and these clusters, these clusters talk to each other. Of course, I haven't labeled all of these particles because there are too many, so I've just given some examples here. Uh, but there is some structure here that might be interesting to understand. And we've only begun doing that. This is quite a, you know, in-depth task. Um, and that's, you know, I mean, I had some more things to say, but I think uh, that's a nice slide to finish on. So I'll thank you for your attention and I'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you for the nice talk, John. Uh, any questions? So you had uh, in, in one slide operator D17, then you had operator A, yep. both of which whose scale lambda has to be very small. In fact, D17 was like 10 to the minus 1 BV or something. Okay, was it here? No, it was in the uh, Hilbert series. Oh, yeah. Um, is, there some, uh, yep. is there some simple reason why these kind of, these some specific operators have very low scales? Yeah, so in this case, I, I mean, it depends on the operator, basically. But looking at this case, D17, you don't have any neutrinos anywhere. Yeah. You only have two electrons. Mm -hmm. And worse than that, this bar means that they're right-handed. So in this particular case, when you estimate the matching contribution, it's going to be proportional to the electron you count as squared. Oh, I see. And then you're going to need a W boson. I see. The left-handed electron. I thought that would have made it higher because you have you have to loop off some W bosons or whatever. But... No, exactly. Right. But so it makes the it makes the contra it makes the matching onto the neutrino it makes the neutrino mass smaller, right? Oh, I see. Right, 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 right. Yeah. I was going the wrong way. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So no, indeed. I mean, uh, and of course, this model is is hopelessly ruled out. Surely. Yeah, yeah. So that brings me to something I didn't talk about, but. One needs to systematically do some phenomenology here because very many of these models are obviously ruled out um, and without even much thought going into it. Um, so you could, you could have like a, you know, 15 dimensional, if you look at the space of 15 dimensional operators, they're all, they're all probably going to be like 
but then you might expect to see something like a D17, very small. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. So actually, I can show you here what the um, estimates look like when you graph them. Um, uh, here. So um, here you can see at dimension 11, generally things move down, but they move down too slowly, which was this novel result that I was telling you. And I was mentioning earlier, you would actually have to go to higher mass dimension to, to completely get the full set of models. However, this is assuming that the Yukawas are order one. You can see in some of these diagrams, they involve the, the UV completions involve many, many, very many Yukawas. And so if you relax this assumption that the Yukawas are exactly one, I mean the new physics Yukawas, and you instead make them think, <clears throat> now it's clear actually that stopping at dimension 11 is probably fine. Yeah. So, um, uh, but yeah, roughly this is the situation. You could keep going, and it could be that very, very many of them are ruled out. Here you can see the width of these kind of worms is some indication of the density of points here, where each of the points represents one of the operators. Um, and this is the prediction for the scale of the new physics, but in log 10, right? And so you can see here, everything below here is like 10 TV. So they're almost all ruled out. If you, if you relax this assumption, that your cows are exactly one. Yeah. Why you are saying it's a rule out if the bottom scale is, let's say, around TV? Oh, because you'd have to have a TV scale left over <clears throat> kicking around with order one couplings to standard model fields. So, I, I mean, I'm just assuming that that's ruled out. It probably is. Yeah, I, okay. It depends on like, Yeah, so it depends on the, the flavor structure. But actually, in these models, one thing that's interesting that I didn't mention, maybe we could just take any of these. Um, yeah, like here, for example. Because this is proportional to the downtime Yukawa matrix, it's going to be dominated. The neutrino mass generation in very many of these uh, um, radiative models is completely dominated by the third generation of standard model fermions. So actually, you can get the whole, you, in principle, you should be able to get the whole structure of the PMNS matrix only by putting the bottom core here. So um, the limits, these, this, um, uh, these, these models give you some prediction that these leptoquarks, for example, um, if you want to relate these models to the to the neutrino masses, then uh, it's just it's just really you're only sensitive to the third generation couplings. Um, but even then, for a third generation electroquark, uh, scale electroquark, I think the atlas and CMS limits are more than a TeV already. Depends on the couplings, right? But I think uh, because it's just QCD driven pair production, yeah. And uh, because I've assumed here order one couplings, uh, I think yeah, I think it's probably ruled out. Other question? Yeah. So, uh, when, when you have listed those models at different events and other things, is it possible to calculate uh, or find out the minimum number of parameters required for a particular model? Yes, that's a good question. Um, so, let's go back here. You can count the number of models, sorry, you can count the number of parameters in the model around you. And naively, you expect, so something like this, right? Naively, you expect that, um, you know, a Yukawa coupling, sorry. Naively, you expect like, you know, some standard model fermions, right? With flavor indices RS, that the Yukawa structure, the Yukawa coupling should have nine independent parameters, right? RS. However, in some cases, actually it's quite common like this, where you have two of the same fermions, just by Fermi direct statistics, you often have restrictions on the number of parameters. Um, I'm not going to do this on the fly because I'm going to get it wrong. Well, in this case, I know this needs to be symmetric, for example. And when you include color, so here, it should probably be anti-symmetric. Um, so there you reduce the number of parameters significantly from, from nine to three or whatever. So um, uh, you could, in principle, count these, these three parameters. The masses, independent components in each of the Yukawas will be uh, nine unless there's some symmetry. So you can, you can count them indeed. Yeah, when the number of models are so large, like 240 or something. Exactly. Then, then it's going to be a huge number of free parameters. And in principle, one could make a plot like, like this, where you kind of weight like this, right? Where instead of just thinking about the scale, you also kind of weight them. You have a kind of cost function, right? Where you weight each model, not only by the scale, but also by the number of free parameters, the number of exotic fields that are introduced and things like this. And maybe that will give you some nice uh, model that stands out that's very testable, but also uh, involves a few number of free parameters. One thing I will say 
so there were paper, um, there was a paper, um, I think from uh, the 2000s by Christian McDonald and others. Um, the, the title was something like uh, the simplest neutrino mass model or something like that. Uh, the simplest radiative neutrino mass model. And they write down a model that is a neutrino mass model with the fewest, uh, a radiative neutrino mass model with the fewest number of free parameters. And that model wasn't written down before they decided to write it down. And our code found it. Um, and I was able to check that. And actually, it's an interesting example. So another good argument for the systematic approach. But yes, you can look for small numbers of parameters and, and weight models by, by that. I have one very nice question. So you also can this, uh, classify, let's say, the parameter space yes. of the, uh, for example, the of your coefficient of the operators by the field contents, which mm -hmm. you do the UV complex, then it might be interesting that. Yes, yes. So I, I don't think I have a plot here, although in the paper I do. Um, that shows by mass dimension the number of exotic multiplets that are introduced. Um, the minimum is one in the seesaw models. The maximum is six, I think. Um, and we have information also in the paper about the number of fermions and scalars and things like this. But um, I don't have a plot in the in the talk. But yes, uh, no, of course you can um, check these things. And so I'll just very briefly mention that um, you can search these things in the database just using pandas if that's familiar to to people. Um, so you can ask, for example, I mean, I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but you can see roughly here that um, uh, the estimate, the symbolic estimate for the neutrino mass is given here and the scale and things like this. So you can ask questions of these models, like, you know, in how many models does um, certain, in how many models do certain couplings exist and things like this, and you can count U1 symmetries and all of this is present in the code. Um, so indeed, uh, one could make a plot. One could, one could perform a query, right? Um, Maybe I could just do it here. Uh, I'll need to run that, which I haven't done. There we go. So we could just ask um, that the number of fields was equal to five. And this is, you know, we could get the length of that. So there are 8,423 models in the database with five fields. And then you could inquire about things like this. Um, yeah. mm. Okay. Is that, sorry, was that what you were asking? Uh, maybe you can get something. Okay, sorry, no worries. <laughs> okay. Uh, another question from Zoom? If not, let's thank Dr. Ah. Uh, I have one question. Okay. Uh, so have you thought about, uh, so up to here you discussed about lepton number two violation in yep. directions? So have you thought much larger lepton number case, violation case? Delta L equal much? three or delta L equal four? Oh, delta L equal to four. No, I haven't thought about that. I have thought about delta B equals one. And we do have a project going um, on, on barrier number violation. Um, but I haven't thought about delta L equals four. That's interesting. Um, right, I mean, in principle, yes. Uh, also delta L equals three, there, there, are, there are lots of things you could do like that. Um, well, we decided to target delta L equals two specifically because neutrino mass is obviously a very concrete problem to think about and there are very many models every day on the archive. So, um, but no, in principle, you could apply this machinery, yes, to, to um, other situations, that's right. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Question? Uh, thanks, Joe, again.